You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 141. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. All of that is just simply to help people connect with Christ in the midst of this distanced you know, living that we have to, that we have to be under. So we're constantly adapting. It's, it's just not an option because again, we're in this season where nobody really knows what we're doing. And so if you don't adapt, you're just, you're going to flounder. Or if you try to be so rigid on how you did things before in your worship services, you just can't, you can't be that rigid anymore. You have to adapt uh, for the sake of reaching people uh, for Christ. Today, we're having a conversation with Jason Wellman. You'll hear him talk about how he's leading from his strengths, specifically around his belief talent theme. You'll also hear his learner and input talent themes coming into play, all in the midst of experimentation and trying new things. And we all know what happens with experimentation and trying new things. Sometimes we fail and we learn to get back up and try again. So as you listen to this episode, my invitation to you is to consider what new things are happening in your midst. What are you trying? What are you experimenting with? As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode, along with resources that we mentioned throughout the episode at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast. To head directly to this episode, you can go to transformingmission.org forward slash 141. Without any further wait, here's our conversation with Jason Wellman. Today, our conversation is with Jason Wellman. And Jason, I want to welcome you to to LeaderCast. So (laughs) let me ask a real tough, tough question. Who are you and what do you get paid to do? All right. Well, I'm uh, Jason Wellman, and I get paid to be the pastor of Sutter Ridge United Methodist Church in Hilliard on the northwest side um, of Columbus. And in addition to that, I get paid to be uh, um, an adjunct faculty member at Portland Seminary in Portland, Oregon. So part of what you're doing as a pastor and part of what you're doing as an instructor is I'm assuming that you're working with people around discipleship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say discipleship is about, you know, 90% of what what I uh, get to do, you know, on the local church level. Discipleship looks, it takes on multiple facets from from, you know, leading Bible studies in small groups to discipling my staff, discipling my leaders, the core group of leaders in in my congregation. And on the faculty side of things, I work with doctoral students. And so discipling them, not only in the in the sense of helping them accomplish their their goal of their their dissertation project, but reminding them that the journey is about who they are as a, a disciple of Christ and, and a leader in the church or outside the church, depending on what their uh, leadership capacity and roles are. So let me let that become a little more personal. What what does being a disciple of Jesus mean to you? I've always found uh, Dallas Willard's definition of discipleship to be one that I remember when I read it uh, in Divine Conspiracy. I was like, oh, that's what I've been I've been waiting on that definition. So he defines a disciple as one who is with Jesus to learn from Jesus how to be like Jesus. And the reason I like that definition of discipleship and, and very personal to, to my own sense of, of my own identity, but, but then in which the way I lead is there's, you know, the, the with Jesus, there's proximity. So you have to be, you have to be in relationship with Jesus to, to be, you know, with him. And, and so that comes through disciplines and, and scripture reading, Bible study, prayer, all those kind of core things the church has taught us over the centuries. But there's an intimacy with that definition, too. I'm with Jesus. And, and the goal of being with Jesus is to learn from him through his teachings, through his guidance, with the ultimate goal, then, of being like him in, in our words, in our deeds, in our actions, and in, in the entirety of our life. So I've always found that kind of threefold definition of discipleship to be 
as I said, personally meaningful, as well as meaningful to my understanding as a discipler of other disciples. So I'm going to shift gears here just a bit. And part of why we wanted to have these conversations with pastors and local church leaders and people of faith in general is that we're living in a unique time. We're living Mm -hmm. in a season that none of us have ever lived in before with all of the challenges that are happening. And in the role that I'm in and also the role that Tim is in, we see leaders who are doing beautiful things in unique ways. And I can look to one person and go, gosh, look at what they're doing. And then someone else is doing something similar, but they're approaching it in a completely different way. And part of the way that I get to what makes each of them different, and yet they're doing the same thing is in and through your Clifton strengths. So Mm -hmm. can you tell us, what are your top five? Yeah, my strengths, I call them the nerd strengths. (laughs) They are, they're learner, input, achiever, belief, and intellection. And, and really learner, input, and intellection, there's a lot of gray in between them because they, they really weave in and out of each other. But yeah, I call them, they're the nerdy ones, which you know means I, I can get stuck sometimes reading way too many things. I have stacks of books in my office that, you know, I'm, I'm, con- I'm, I'm a frequent Amazon shopper. And so they're constantly dropping off new books at, at my house. So as you think about this season that you're leading in, and this can be for the local church or the work that you're doing with the seminary, how are your top five fueling your leadership? Yeah. You know, just in general about the period in which we find ourselves, there there are those that have entered into this pandemic season, totally understanding the the suffering that has come as a result of this season in which we find ourselves. I don't, I don't want to minimize that by by any by any means, but there are those who have entered this season with fear and trepidation. And I think I've entered this season with with excitement, specifically thinking of of leadership in this in this time where nobody knows what they're doing, which I find to be really refreshing. Because it becomes like this season in which we can experiment and try new things. And so for me, my, my top strength as a learner, I'm constantly reading what other people are doing. And there's always a part of me in reading what other people are doing to say, well, I want to I put that to practice and see does it actually work. And so this is the season in which we can do that. Where you can, you know, all these talking heads are saying, hey, try this thing, try this thing. And there's such freedom to try it out and then to see, okay, that, that failed, that didn't work. Let's assess it and and go back at it. Now I've actually been working with my staff on this lately. I joke with them that it's, it's Oprah's book club is our staff meeting because we're always, there's always another thing that we're reading, but it's not just to read in the sense of like, you know, it puffs ourselves up, look how smart we are, but it's to try what we're reading. And so we're in the midst of reading this book right now together called anxious church, anxious people leading uh, through change. And I've given my staff complete permission to try everything new, to, to use this season in which we're in, to experiment, and then to be reflective. So try something. If it works, why did it work? Try something. If it didn't work, why didn't it work? Let's have conversations about how we might might change those. So I think that that learner and kind of input part of myself is really thriving in this season of just gathering so much wisdom and insight from other people and then trying to figure out like, okay, what does this really work? And let's let's try it out and to give ourselves permission to fail and fall flat on our face. I love it. So in the midst of the experimenting and the reflecting and the action that you're taking. What do you celebrate God doing in your life and leadership in the past three months? In the past three months, I'd say what I would celebrate is, is the sense that, that we're not alone in this, in this journey, that even though we're distant from each other, the gift of technology has allowed us to connect with people in, in greater ways than we probably could have done uh, pre-COVID. 
but just seeing God, God is still, even though things are bad, even though church isn't the way we want it to be right now, God is still with us. God is still moving. God is not limited to our church buildings that we can put something together and God will take the gift of technology and expand it beyond what we were originally. Like, for example, we've on our online worship, like many churches have been doing some version of live stream or some version of online worship. We've reached people that we never thought about targeting. Like all of a sudden we've gotten connected with people who have joined us from across the country. We've had spouses whose one person, husband or wife doesn't come to church with them. But now that we're online, they're worshiping with them regularly every single Sunday. I mean, I've just seen God do these really cool things with the meager offerings that we that we kind of throw together. And God uses that in such a such an amazing way. And I think those those um, fruits that we're seeing have then helped sustain us and encourage us to keep trying new things, keep pushing ourselves even further for the sake of the mission and the vision, not to make ourselves look good so we can kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we put a good worship service together online. It's, it's really so that more people will hear of the saving grace of Jesus. With what you've said, Jason, in regard to achiever and belief, one of the things that I know that you've done really well is to adapt in a, in a situation where it's not, as we've said, normal. It, now it's not going to be the way it's been before. You've been working on ways to adapt to bring things uh, about. And part of that is because you've been able to use these strengths that we've just talked about, achiever and belief, because there's a mission and mm-hmm. you're working to accomplish that mission. And so the adapting is facing the obstacles and getting around them. Is that is there mm-hmm. is there something specific or particular that you've done that that illustrates that? I think achiever and belief go together pretty well. Okay. Um, because belief drives my achievement. Like I said, belief this this unshakable belief that people need to know who Jesus is and they need to be in relationship. It gives you permission to, uh, to, to fail, to try things and to fail and to get back up and try to, a new thing or adjust the thing you did before because the desire doesn't change. That belief in who Christ is that doesn't change. So in, in this season that we're in, everybody has to be adaptable because none of us have ever gone through a pandemic before. And so I, th- I think for, for me and my team, like I said, I've just given us permission to, to try something new and to just go for it and see what sticks on the wall and, and rally the troops for the sake of reaching people. So I'd say where we, we have made some, some adjustments would be, you know, our, our big thing was early on in the pandemic when everything shut down. Like every church, we kind of had to figure out, okay, what what does church look like for us? And we were very adamant that we wanted to have live stream, so not a pre-recorded service, but it needed it needed to be live. And it's not a criticism of how other churches have have done services, but for us, we wanted we wanted the gathered body to gather at the same time. So we had to learn on the fly how to do live stream how to keep people safe, you know, the people who are in the building, all of those things. So we were constantly adapting. So every single week, my worship planning team, we get together and we do a an assessment of the previous service. And we walk through every element and we say, did that work? If it didn't work, okay, what do we have to change and adjust for next week so that we make sure that that, you know, that transition or that whatever needs to, to happen and for the again, not for the sense we want to come off as like we have the greatest live stream worship service that's on the internet. We want to remove any obstacle that would keep people from engaging in a relationship with Jesus. So if that means we need to, you know, figure out oh, the technology is buffering, we're going to tackle that issue and try to figure out how do we make sure it doesn't buffer for people. If it's a oh that camera angle is really wonky, we're going to work on getting that camera angle cleaned up. So people can have an encounter with Christ. So we're constantly adjusting and adapting all the time. Like I said, every week 
we're having conversations about how, how do we rework that? What went well? What didn't work? What do we need to adjust um, for the future? We've adjusted even the ways in which we communicate with people. Um, we have a chat thread. We, we tried a thing a couple of weeks ago where people were voting in the midst of worship so that we could, we could get this engagement. We were having live feedback as it was happening. All of that is just simply to help people connect with Christ in the midst of this distanced you know, living that we have to, that we have to be under. So we're constantly adapting. It's, it's just not an option because again, we're in this season where nobody really knows what we're doing. And so if you don't adapt, you're just, you're going to flounder. Or if you try to be so rigid on how you did things before in your worship services, you just can't, you can't be that rigid anymore. You have to adapt uh, for the sake of reaching people uh, for Christ. And and that's the part that doesn't change, and you don't adapt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's where I think that belief is, that is a strong conviction of mine, a strong conviction in who Christ is. That doesn't change no matter what season we're in, uh, whether we're doing live worship, online worship, whether I'm sitting in a you know podcast with you all, or having a cup of coffee with somebody, that, that core belief in who Christ is, and that desire that more people will know Him, that never changes. So I'm wondering, as as you think about the new people that you're reaching, and you name some of them, the spouses that weren't participating in worship, the folks that either couldn't come or were at such a distance that they weren't going to come to your local mm-hmm. congregation, how have, how have you tried to communicate that, I'm going to call it a value if I can use that word, that value of yours, that mission of yours, to help people know who Jesus is. I mean, obviously you do that through the preaching of the message on Sunday morning. Yeah. But is there something specific that, is there a specific message or a specific way that you've tried to communicate that to folks so that they understand what the church is about, what your specific congregation is about, and who you are as a leader? Yeah. So our, our mission statement at our church drives every decision that we make. And our mission statement is seek the unchurch, nurture disciples, and partner with Jesus in the transformation of the world. So every time we're having a conversation about a ministry, those, that, those three words, seek, nurture, transform, are driving our decision making. So then we communicate that with the congregation, that we love that people join us online on Sunday morning, and that's part of that seeking. But we want people to grow in a nurturing relationship with Jesus. Again, it's to be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus how to be like Jesus. So then we were constantly inviting people into discipling communities of some sort. That could be we're doing a lot of Bible studies online via Zoom. We're, we're having house churches right now where people are actually meeting in their backyard on Sunday morning, worshiping live stream with us. But then we, we send them questions to reflect upon with those who have gathered. So we've had, we've had house churches invite their neighbors, literally their physical neighbors, to come to their backyard with a chair, socially distanced, mask, all that, all that stuff, proper protocol. But then there's questions of reflection and engagement. So we're constantly, okay, what did you hear in the sermon? Why does that matter? What does that mean to your life? Then we're always challenging our people to be in some sort of missional relationship in some sort of transformational ministry. And they could do that on, on their own by finding their own kind of personal mission that God's called them to, to something that we've sponsored. So a quick example would be at the last minute, we put a plea out via our social media outlets. Hey, we need quickly 500 peanut butter sandwiches for a homeless shelter. They reached out to us and said, we had somebody back out. We need 500 PB and J's. We quickly just sent out this notice via social media, and in two days, we had over 2,000 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that people made, and we had them snap pictures of it. We, you know, it was a big celebration that, that we had. So we're constantly challenging our people to not just be a spectator. Don't just watch a service. Now figure out, okay, what does this mean in your life? Take it deeper in your life. And, and then if, you, if you're going to be like Jesus, that means you have to go out into the world and love your neighbors. So we're so that thread in one way or another is constantly being fed to our people 
in public worship, when we're, you know, leading in worship, you may hear that phrase, seek, nurture, transform, to email communications, social media communications, uh, video testimony communications, all of those things. We're constantly feeding people through that that mindset. We're, we, we've come to know Christ. Now we need to become like him and then act like him in, in missional uh, ways in the world. I'm sitting here smiling, and those that are listening can't see my smile, but I'm smiling because what you just illustrated for anybody who's listened to our previous podcasts is you've illustrated a disciple making process. And on mm-hmm. our other episodes, we have talked about disciple making. And if you've been around Tim and I at all, you know that we talk about disciple making in terms of hope, that there's hospitality. How are you reaching out and receiving people? How are you offering Christ, inviting them into a relationship with Jesus and with one another, inviting them to make that commitment, practicing the faith, all of the spiritual disciplines um, and worship that we participate in, the things that we do as people of faith that make us that help us to know who Jesus is, and then engaging in in service. And so for anyone who's listened to our pre- any of our previous podcasts <laughs> that we've been following this format, what you just heard Jason do is illustrate that in the way that his local context has brought that to life through a very specific focus on making disciples in the way that he has taught the people that he's leading to understand what a disciple is. So thank you for for that illustration and for that example, Jason, for helping folks to be able to hear so beautifully how your belief <laughs> talent shines through and keeps fo- folks focused on that. And without really knowing it, knowing that you're also illustrating for anybody who's listening, who has listened to our previous podcast, what a disciple making process might look like using completely different language than Mm -hmm. we may use, but focusing on the exact same thing. Um, See, he's all, he's already taught me seek, nurture, transform. <laughs> right. There you go. There you go. That that is that is it. May I do this because I think it would be good for for people to hear. Just give us an example of some courageous decisions that you're making right now as a leader. In, in the midst of this season that we we've, we've been in, we've had some staffing transitions. And in, for, for a myriad of, of reasons, nothing, nothing bad. I mean, the, the, the transitions have just happened kind of organically. And my initial response when a staff person leaves is kind of that, that first response is, okay, this person is transitioned out. I need to fill that position and so that we can just kind of get back to normal and so that there's not a big hiccup. And I think what this season is has taught me is to be a, is is to be more strategic about some of those decisions. So, like I said, we've had we have two staff people that have transitioned. One is in the process of transitioning into retirement. One has transitioned out this summer. And and instead of me initially just filling it, I've been thinking about okay, is this a time to revamp everything? Is this a time that that we need to really look at all of our staffing positions? and dream something new up. And so I'm in the process right now of dreaming something new that the Cider Ridge has never experienced before. But I think post COVID, when life does kind of get back to some sort of of normalcy, will actually be a better fit for the church. That's going to take some courageous decisions because it's something they've never experienced before. It means we're going to have to uh, start moving some resources around to start dreaming of, and I don't want to give it all away yet because I'm in that process of like my team doesn't even know quite exactly what it's going to look like yet. But like I said, it's more it's more just the sense of you know I've been asking my staff to try new things, and now me as a leader, I have an opportunity to really try something new through a, a different staffing position, and so I'm being far more strategic about that thinking long-term down the road, not just, Oh, we, we have, we have a position we need to fill. So for us, what's it going to look like three to five years down the road if we have this new position in place? So I'm working with my leadership right now and developing that position, um, casting a vision for that position, figuring out who might the person, what are the characteristics 
uh, of a leader that could fit this position. Uh, and I know I'm being a bit vague. I apologize, but more or less just the sense of of I I, I don't want to just I don't want to just go back to the way things were. I, I've told my team, my leaders, my staff that I want to be a different church on the other side of COVID-19. I want to be a church that is even more focused on the mission and vision than what we've been before. And so we have to look at all parts of our church, our staffing and everything, to make sure we really are positioned for whatever God has in store in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are you ready for what we call our rapid fire questions? These are 10 quick questions that will help those that are listening get to know you a little bit better as a person and as a leader, and also hopefully a moment to pause and laugh and just recognize our own humanity. So Tim's going to get us started with the first one. What's your morning beverage of, of choice? Coffee. Thick, hot, black, strong coffee. The thicker, the better. What's your favorite or go-to Bible verse? Oh, man, that's a hard one. Well, that's probably not so hard. My ordination banner is kind of my life verse, which is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, which, in which Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest for your soul. And I think that drives my sense of mission as a pastor, as a leader, is to help people come to meet Jesus and they can find that, that overwhelming shalom and rest for their soul. What's your favorite season and why? I am a summer person. I hate the cold. I hate the cold. So everybody else is excited about fall and I'm dreading it because I know it's coming around the corner. <laughs> so summer, the hotter it is, the better. I think I was born in the wrong state. I think I'm supposed to live in the South. So yeah, summer for sure. It's gotten cooler sooner than it was supposed to, hasn't it? Yes. Yes. And it's, it's dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get your first Bible? Oh, man. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, probably at a very, very young age. I just, I never, I can't think of a time that I was given, I wasn't raised Methodist, so I don't know of a specific time in which, like, there wasn't a formal service that I got a Bible. I probably just always had one. What's the last thing you read or you're reading now? So I'm reading about four books right now because, <laughs> again, you know, learner input. I'm always reading something. I'm reading two, two books that are that have been very meaningful, one in, in my own life. Uh, and I'm going to blank on the name, of course, but it's by Trevor Hudson, and it's about a friendship with God. And the other would be a book, and the author I'm blanking on, but it is on using the Enneagram for spiritual formation. And the author's name is, I'm completely blanking on his name. But those are the two books that I'm kind of digging into right now. You said four. You want to clue us in on the other two? So the other one would be, I'm reading the book my staff is reading right now, which is Anxious Church, Anxious People. And then I'm reading, the other book would be, it just came out, called The the Deeper Spiritual Life. And it's by, um, I'm blanking on his name too, Villados is his, is his last name. Awesome. Thank the you. The Deeper Journey, I think it was called. What's your favorite snack food? I'm a, I'm a salty chip type person. Any type of just, if it's salty and it's fried, I'll, I'll, I'll pair it up. What's your least favorite household chore? I hate the feeling of when laundry comes out of the dryer. Like when it's hot, it makes my skin crawl. So. That means I hate folding laundry when it's warm. My wife and I, we have very defined roles, and laundry folding is one of hers. I just hate that feeling. I don't know why. I hate that feeling of when it's warm and comes out of the dryer. That surprises me, Jason, because you like hot things. You like hot I know, weather. I know. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. The last time that you laughed. Two seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> favorite vacation spot or place you relax cannon beach oregon where i the portland seminary is where i did my doctoral work and all of our instead of being stuck in a classroom 
all of our classes uh, were at Cannon Beach, which is right on the coast. And so I go back at least one to two times a year. And it's the second there's a road, you come off of a mountain, you go down. The second you hit Cannon Beach, I could just feel my body relax and a lightness comes over me. Now we know why you're an adjunct. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They pay me. They pay me now to go out there. <laughs> Last question. What do people misunderstand about you? Uh, so on the Enneagram, I don't know if, if you two have done any work with the Enneagram, but on the Enneagram, I'm an eight and an eight is a challenger and they can come off as very strong, very aggressive. And, and I think what people misconstrue sometimes is that being a, a type A, eight type person, you're, you can come off as mean. And I don't mean to be mean. It's, it's, I actually have a very soft heart. Like I, I cry at commercials all the time. Like it, you know, I'm the guy that's crying at a movie. If there's a cute baby, I'm blubbering over the baby. So there's, there is this aggressive side to me, but there is definitely a very, very soft part of me as well. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this conversation and to be on the podcast. Are there any last words of wisdom that you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, I would say again, to what I was talking about earlier, this is the season to not crouch in fear, but to try new things. People not only not only try things just to try them, but the, the season truly is 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 ripe. The harvest is plentiful. People are struggling right now. People are exhausted by the weight of the world, politics, everything, and people need to know Jesus. And this is the season not to slow down, not to back off, but to keep engaging with the mission and vision of reaching people uh, for Christ. Jason, I uh, appreciate you teaching us today. Oh yeah. Um, I'm grateful for you and your leadership, but especially for the conversation today. You've you've modeled for us disciple making process in 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 a congregation, but it's also how you live your life. So I'm grateful for for what we've experienced through this this time together. Thank you. Thank you. It was it was fun. I appreciate it. There you have it. This is a season to try new things. So again, I'll ask you, what new things are you trying? What are you experimenting with? What new thing is God doing in your midst? In this season that there are so many things that are unknown, what we know and I want to remind you of today is God has gifted you So how will you use your natural talents and strengths to lead others in this season and maybe, just maybe, to try new things? Let me remind you that you can find show notes for this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 141. You'll find a list of resources mentioned on this episode on that page, along with an invitation to explore how your strengths can come to life in disciple making. Now go lead a movement of Jesus followers. Bye for now.